people are held in immigration detention because there's some sort of issue with their immigration status. Their right to stay in the UK is being questioned. More than half of, of the people in immigration detention earlier this year had been detained for more than a month. And many people end up getting detained more than six months or even multiple years. The UK has one of the Europe's largest detention systems. We've got around 30,000 people who are detained each year. Uh, there's no time limit. Uh, the human consequences and the financial costs and indeed the efficacy of the system is increasingly controversial. It goes on as long as the Home Office or the government wishes, as long as the executive wishes, and there's no hard limit that says, look, at some point this detention has got to come to an end. Other reasons you can be detained, for example, uh, serving a prison sentence or in psychiatric hospital, are set out in great detail in the law. So the time for which you can be detained and the basis on which you can be detained is very tightly constrained in law. And immigration detention is not like that. Although it's supposed to be used for removals, quite often we see people who aren't actually removed. The number of people who are actually released into the community from immigration detention is surprisingly high. I think it's as, it's, it's as high as around 50%. Months or sometimes years later, they're released back into the community and, and you're left thinking, well, what on earth was the point of that? Detention probably is necessary in some cases, but the Home Office, in, in my experience anyway, isn't very good at working out which cases it's needed in and, and which ones it's, it's not. So what we see is the detention of individuals happening by default. Almost all of the places where people can be detained are now built to category B prison conditions. So it's actually much more like being in a prison. What's important about it is that it doesn't require any court order in the first place. The Criminal jurisdiction requires that someone is charged with an offence. They have due process. They have a lawyer. They have to be given a trial. They have to be convicted either by a judge or a, or a jury. And that has to be to a high standard. And even then, even if they are convicted, they are only sent to prison if they've committed a particularly serious crime. Where you're taken into administrative detention, immigration detention, there's none of that. It, it, it's simply a, a relatively junior official at the Home Office decides that they've got spaces in detention or they've got spaces on a flight back to a certain country and they want to detain and remove nationals of, of your particular nationality and so they take a decision to bring you into detention. That's then followed through often with essentially a dawn raid where you get a whole squad of immigration officials arriving at your house very early in the morning and, and taking you away. A lot of people I speak to are surprised to hear that um, you can be detained even if you haven't committed a crime in the UK. A lot of people in immigration detention haven't actually committed any kind of crime. They've perhaps broken immigration laws, they've maybe made a claim for asylum that hasn't succeeded or they might have overstayed a visa or entered illegally in the first place, but they haven't actually committed a, a normal criminal offence like theft or, or anything violent or anything like that. Immigration detention is an affront to the rule of law because in the English common law, individual liberty is one of the cornerstones of the freedoms that we all hold dear. So if the police detain you, they can only do so for a short period and then you're granted bail. If you are locked up in a psychiatric hospital, you have an automatic right of access to a tribunal which will review your detention. If you are in prison, the parole board will look at your detention and see if you can be released. But in immigration detention, there isn't any such mechanism. And so it's the one area where we allow people to be locked up, sometimes for very long periods, years and years, without um, accessing a court. Another issue is uh, the lack of a genuine, robust way of preventing people from experiencing harm in detention. There are numerous instances that have come up in case law of people being subject to really serious kinds of harm as a result of detention. The UK has breached Article 3, the prohibition on torture and inhuman and degrading treatment several times in its use of immigration detention. Immigration detention has a, a a terrible cost for the people concerned. Each and every day can be a traumatic experience. Some of the people who are in detention have been uh, diagnosed with serious mental illnesses. It's very hard to be locked up somewhere where you don't know when you're going to get out. People have had 
mental health collapses essentially. It's, it's taken a horrible physical toll on some people as well. Lawyers have reported plenty of cases where people have been detained and really nothing is going on in terms of um, expediting their immigration case, securing removal for very long periods of time. I've had cases where a decision isn't made for six months despite repeated chasing to the caseworker. There is nothing to compel them to, to hurry up. The main problem is the lack of a time limit because all the other problems I think that are associated with immigration detention really flow from the, the lack of that limit. At law, the presumption is that someone will not be detained unless it's necessary and they'll only be detained for the shortest possible time. So that's, that's the common law and that's also the Home Office's published policy. What practitioners see is that that is uh, not often observed. People are detained when there isn't really any prospect of removing them and they're detained when they might be able to be granted bail. They might comply with reporting or with being given an electronic tag. So there's other ways of keeping in touch with the person other than locking them up. There are many problems with how the Home Office presents in court and particularly how it presents in bail hearings. The Home Office for a bail hearing will produce what's called the bail summary which is a list of reasons why the Home Office says that the person should remain in detention. The Home Office will always contest a bail application. Everyone I spoke to was scathing about the quality of the bail summary. There are many, many examples of inaccuracies, inconsistencies and frankly misleading statements of fact in, in these summaries. One of the concerns that I've had with, with some cases I've dealt with is that the way that the Home Office prepares bail applications is that they're really looking for I dare I say excuses to detain a person rather than reasons to detain. And the reason I say that is that the decision to detain doesn't seem to have been very well thought through. And for example, the person isn't close to actually being removed from the UK. Um, the Home Office is really struggling to liaise with the authorities of the country concerned to, to, to get the documents to remove somebody. And when that detention is challenged, the individual Home Office um, caseworkers or, or the presenting officers who have to represent the Home Office in court are left really scrabbling around for, for justification for the detention and they're placed in the unenviable position of essentially it's their job to try and make up excuses as to why this person should be detained even though on a legal analysis there seems to be no real legal justification for it. Occasionally I've seen this in a refusal letter where you actually see they, they haven't deleted all of the standard paragraphs. So um, the, the reasons for um, bail, the bail summary we call it, um, will have alternate paragraphs about sureties. And if you do have sureties, then they'll say this. If you don't have sureties, then they'll say that. And so I've seen cases where literally they've left both paragraphs in. And it's, it's a situation where essentially you can't win. They're forced by the legal process to try and come up with certain reasons. And, and essentially they're they're really manufacturing them, I'm sorry to say. So in a bail application, the Home Office is represented by a presenting officer. The difficulty is that often that presenting officer will be dealing with three or four or even five applications and they may not have even seen the papers in that case until the very morning that they are presenting. They are totally reliant on the limited number of papers that they are given on that day and they have to present their case based on those very limited instructions. Now what I've experienced is that these presenting officers are not familiar with the entire background of the case and often they are told to repeat mantras such as a decision will be made very soon. They've got no idea whether a decision is likely to be made very soon. Now I don't suspect that the HOPO, the, the, the presenting officer, is deliberately lying but the fact is they don't know the full facts. I don't think I've ever seen a Home Office presenting officer mislead the tribunal. I, I doubt any would, would knowingly do so but they don't have the same kind of training and they don't have the same kind of code of ethics that um, professional lawyers do and I have seen presenting officers um, fail to disclose important information, for example, uh, even where it's, it's actually on the file in front of them. And I have seen quite inappropriate questioning um, by some presenting officers. I have had a presenting officer um, make false representations to the court in a bail hearing about how quickly removal was likely to take place. They're civil servants, they've often got some kind of legal background, but they, they're not fully legally qualified and they don't have a formal duty to the court. Solicitors and barristers have their own professional regulators and they have codes of conduct and duties to the court, but the Home Office doesn't have 
uh, the same system of regulation. That leads to a problem with accountability. When the system as a whole is failing, then all of those small parts add up to create a deeply flawed, uh, deeply, some, deeply incompetent bureaucracy. But each individual officer in the Home Office doesn't take responsibility because they can always blame a different wing, a different officer within the Home Office for making that mistake. They treat themselves as just a cog in a much bigger machine. And when the machine is broken, the cog doesn't take the blame. There's very little scrutiny and little accountability for what goes on in the bail process. Bail decisions are not reported, which means that they don't, they're not public and they don't form part of a body of case law. Adjudication in bail hearings is a tricky process. It's a summary process. The quality of evidence that's before you is often extremely limited. Being an immigration judge and deciding bail applications is extremely difficult. One of the big differences between um, immigration detention and a, a criminal conviction is that there aren't the guidelines, essentially. There's simply no equivalent at all for immigration detention. And judges are um, warned that six months in immigration detention is a, is, a, is a long time, but that's about it, basically. And there's no agreement or consistency on what would be a very long time for certain types of previous behaviour. There's a huge amount of discretion, which is, it, you know, it could be a good thing in some contexts, but in this context it means that there's no consistency and judges are really left up to themselves about, about how long they allow somebody to be detained for. Some judges, in my experience, are fair. They understand that immigration detention has a, a very negative impact on the individuals concerned, and they understand that months of detention is actually a very long time. That's equivalent to a pretty serious prison sentence and, and criminal conviction. Unfortunately, there are some judges who, who don't seem to understand that, and they seem perhaps overly concerned about what um, the media would think if they were to release somebody. And even though a person has been detained for a very long time and previously had a record of reporting regularly, not absconding or, or running away and staying in touch with the Home Office, um, some judges are very reluctant indeed to, to allow people out on bail. Another issue with bail hearings is that they're subject to very limited oversight. If a poor bail decision is made, in theory it could be judicially reviewed, but that's extremely rare. Applications for judicial review are heard in the upper tribunal, the Immigration and Asylum Chamber. That venue can only be described as inundated with, with thousands of applications. The delays in the upper tribunal are staggering. If you're making an application based on you being a victim of trafficking, or if you're saying that you're a victim of torture, a six month delay in, in having your case heard is, is extremely significant. Another real challenge for judges is dealing with people who don't have a legal representative. Immigration law is really complicated. The legal procedures are really complicated. It's changing all the time. Dealing with the statutory rules, the policies, the overlap between EEA rules and, and the British system, dealing with the refugee convention and the implications of that, dealing with deportation rules. These are very difficult uh, concepts and, and, and fast evolving. Uh, for a, a lay individual to try to make sense of those rules is extremely difficult. When that lay person is someone whose first language isn't even English, who is often destitute because for a significant amount of time they haven't been permitted to work in the UK, there is a, a serious difficulty for that individual to represent themselves. Then the issue is how do they afford legal representation when they, when, when they simply have no money? Legal aid has been drastically cut for them. Well, it is possible to get basic legal advice about your detention. Um, however, it's not possible to get legal advice about your underlying immigration situation. 
And that, that's a kind of catch-22 because you, you've been detained because of your underlying uh, immigration situation. So it's no use to you really to have advice simply about the, the prospect of bail or, or, or detention. What you really need is, is proper advice about whether you do have a legal basis to stay in the UK, whether any further application might potentially be justified, or even um, advice that you, know, you really have reached the end of the line and, and that you haven't got any further basis to remain. People can sign up for a 30 minute appointment where they can get legal advice on their case. The free legal advice is limited to certain categories of people and within those categories only for certain types of application. Solicitors say that it, have universally said that it's very difficult to get a grasp of the case with, within that time frame. The surgeries can be booked up a long time in advance. Many people are then having to rely on um, NGOs and charities. Overall there is no equality of, of fairness uh, in accessing the courts and many do rely on pro bono representation in the end. There's a problem with the rule of law. It's because of access to justice. It needs to be solved.